Hey, it's Ivan from the EV Stock Channel here, and today we've got the man, the mustache, the battery guru, Jordan Gieske back. Thanks. <laughs> I like that new intro. So the main question that I've been getting is, Jordan, can you build us some knowledge up on battery basics? Yeah. Oh, wow, that's very broad. I, the first thing I started, the first um, Google search that I ran, um, Oh, about four or five months ago, five months ago, when I started researching battery, I researched types of batteries and it started at a very basic level. There's primary batteries and then there's secondary batteries. Primary batteries are the ones that are just used once and then you pitch them. Uh, secondary batteries are the rechargeable batteries. And of course, the rechargeable batteries are the batteries that we're interested in. And the rechargeable, ba rechargeable batteries are also more difficult because the reactions have to be reversible. So you've got cylindrical batteries, prismatic batteries. I'm wondering if you can maybe just uh, touch on what those batteries are and what the advantages and say disadvantages of why someone would choose one over the other. Actually, I'll start with the cylindrical. Uh, what they do is they take the cathode and the anode and they have, of course, plate uh, copper and nickel sheets with those active materials. And then they put a separator in between. They roll this up and then they uh, you have like a what's called a jelly roll. You stick that in a, a kind of a hard case tube, and that's your cylindrical cell. It's uh, you know about the size of your finger. They they call them shotgun shells sometimes. Yep. Are you able to sort of describe the mechanisms of how a battery that has a mm -hmm. electrode rolled in the battery how that works? Because a lot of people are thinking you've got this battery where you've got a negative side on one side, and then you've got the positive side, and there's a current flowing from one end to the other. But when it's all sort of mixed in, mm -hmm. the dynamics of that are a little bit different. I was just wondering if you can touch on that topic. I've never really thought of a way to explain that before because that's the first time somebody's asked that question. But as I'm thinking about it, probably the best way to visualize it is um, when you're looking at that battery diagram with the cathode and anode and there's electrolyte in between and there's a separator, that's view that as maybe a, a two dimensional cutaway and imagine that going on for uh, like a hallway. Well, yeah. and then you took that hallway and you twisted it. Okay. And then you just stuck it into a, uh, like a cell. Does that help explain? Yeah, it does. Okay, uh, cool. Maybe we can uh, build on that too. Mm -hmm. So within that hallway, you've got the, the anode and cathode mm -hmm. and when, I, when, I, when I've been looking at the pictures, you see sort of the layers that those have. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a comb where you've got like layers with the... Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I pro actually we can build on that. That's a really good idea to build on because imagine if that hallway had shelves on each side. Yeah. And those shelves are where the uh, ions are stored that go back and forth. And yeah, when you charge the battery, the ions move to one side of the hallway onto another set of shelves and uh, yeah, charge and discharge, they just move back and forth. When, when they're going through, you've got the separator in the middle. Mm -hmm. Are they tunneling their way through the separator or how does that work? Yes, because the ions are uh, really small and the separator has, uh, is porous. So even though it seems like a solid piece of plastic to us, at the atomic lighter, there's quite big holes in there and just choop, choop, the ions can just zip through. Sure. And then maybe just to keep building on that. So for example, you've got one side, you've got the anode and mm -hmm. anodes currently are made of graphite. Yes. And the next sort of generation is they're starting to incorporate silicon. Mm -hmm. What is it about graphite and silicon that make a good anode? Why, why were mm -hmm. those materials selected? Um, I'll cover that in a, a second, but I just thought of our, our analogy. We were talking about the reason why it's shelves is because there's, uh, if you look at graphite at a molecular layer, um, it's actually individual layers of graphene. So yeah. that's why I was using the shelf analogy, because if you look at those materials under a scanning electron microscope, there's actually layers of material and then there's little gaps. So that's why I was using the shelves. All right, so back to your question about the difference between graphite and silicon and why uh, we're trying to move away from uh, graphite and towards silicon. Um, graphite has, it doesn't expand or contract much when 
those ions go over and enter the material. It's very stable. And it's like that on the cathode side as well. And that's why intercalation has worked so well in the past. And uh, intercalation is the process of uh, those ions being stored on the shelves or in, in those layered materials. With silicon, it's able to store much more energy and many more ions, but it expands and contracts quite a bit. And as it's expanding and contracting, it's creating um, mechanical stresses within the battery. And it, uh, as soon as you have mechanical stresses, uh, it's, it starts cracking what's called the solid electrolyte interface. All that is just, it's just a fancy word for a protective layer on the battery. And as soon as it expands, creates cracks in that or little imperfections, and it kind of has to self-heal and the layer has to reform. And it gets kind of like, I don't know, maybe the best way to describe it is a callus. And the thicker that electrolyte, solid electrolyte interface gets, that protective layer, um, the harder it is for the battery to cycle. Yep. So with that, uh, you've talked about uh, additives and binders. And when you first charge up a cell for the first time, it creates a protective layers on both the anode and cathode. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, actually, I'm going to be doing a video on this in a few days, but what happens is there's something called first cycle loss. At the battery factory, uh, after they've created the batteries, they run the battery through a first charge cycle. And what happens is uh, the solid electrolyte interface forms. And the solid electrolyte interface is made of lithium and other... Um, materials from within the battery, like the additives. As soon as that lithium is used up in that first cycle to form the layer, it can't be cy cycled back and forth anymore. So the first time you cycle a battery, you're losing uh, like five to five to ten percent of its energy capacity, and that's capacity you never get back. Now the customers don't see that, but if there's if we can ever find a way to fix that, which you know, and maybe at some point Tesla will reveal something like that. Um, mm -hmm then you'll see an, immediately a you know a five to ten percent increase in energy capacity. Okay. Mm. Well, maybe uh, we should probably cross over to the cathode side, and maybe mm. you can talk about uh, say maybe the the NCA NCM chemistries. Why Tesla's using them? Yeah, the the reason why they've ch chosen the nickel cobalt aluminum chemistry, my understanding is because it's one of the highest specific energy materials. Um, it's a little bit more than what's called nickel manganese cobalt. And you'll notice what both of those have in common is the nickel. Uh, nickel is, uh, when it's uh, mixed with other materials, it tends to have a really strongly positive effect on energy capacity. So nickel cobalt aluminum chemistries, they, they're able to get a lot of nickel into them and still keep them stable. Okay. And then why is there a difference between, say, the automotive, which uses the NCA, and then the home storage? Why do they use NCM? Why do they take out aluminum and put in manganese? Oh, that's a good question. I haven't looked much into the detail on uh, their uh, storage. And I don't know if anybody has that information. I don't, I'm not sure if anybody has taken apart a Powerwall battery and compared that to one of the automotive batteries. That's an interesting question. But... Uh, I imagine the reason why they do that is because they're able to create a chemistry with better longevity with the NMC, if that is what they're using. Okay. And just to wrap it up, uh, what other areas are there in the battery? Like I'm thinking there's current collectors, there's the shell casing. I'm just wondering if you can sort of tie it all up. Um, yeah, the, I actually just released a video today off the cuff because Elon Musk said that uh, the patent that they just released on uh, a tabless battery cell um, is probably underappreciated. The words were something to that effect. So I created some props <laughs> and I did a live video. But basically what it comes down to is um, generally um, the electrons, when they uh, exit uh, the battery cell, they have to go through all these different layers or not go through the different layers, but they, they go into the current collector. And of course, the current collector is a spiral, and you have to follow that current collector until you get to the tab, which is kind of uh, the exit 
So it looks like a big bottleneck. Yeah, it's a, exactly. It's a massive bottleneck. And as the electron is going through that material, my understanding is it's bumping into other things and that generates heat and, and more heat generates more resistance. And it's kind of a whatever a, a vicious cycle, yeah. whatever the opposite of a virtuous cycle is. Um, yeah, so the way that they've proposed to fix this in their patent is to remove uh, those and rather than going, you know, following the current collector all the way around to that tab, uh, you just create an offset between the cathode material and uh, the actually the foil itself, and then you can connect this directly to the cap of the battery. So rather than following that circle around, you can just go whoop, straight up to the edge and exit the battery. Um, so less heat, um, less resistance, that means better discharge and charge rates, and potentially a larger battery cell. Uh, part of the reason why battery cells are the, the size they are, which is kind of small, is so they can dissipate heat better. Um, and if you're generating less heat, you can make them bigger. Well, with and, that, well, what are the safety implications? I don't know yet. <laughs> I, I just, uh, I don't know if I fully understand the patent yet, but that's uh, that seemed to be the basics of it. Because in the patent, they give multiple different embodiments. They say, we could do it this way, we could do it this way, we could do it this way. And... Um, which way are they going to choose? I don't think it really matters, but the, the key concept is being able to exit straight up rather than following the uh, foil around. Yep. And Oh, and the reason why you'd want a bigger battery cell is because it's easier to manufacture a battery with, say, 1,000 battery cells rather than 4,000 battery cells. So in order for them to be pr producing a larger battery, I would presume that they would have to have their manufacturing processes you know, really down pat because you would have yield loss and the larger the battery, the more that would affect yield loss, I would assume. Uh, maybe, maybe not. It might, uh, because this process is simpler, you don't have to fiddle around with all welding all those little tabs. That's really finicky. You're talking about a foil that is um, micrometers thick, which is, you know, just a little bit thicker than aluminum foil. Uh, and you're attaching another piece of metal to it that similarly is delicate. So it might actually improve their yield, right? I don't know. Okay, well, if that improves the yield, that would be a double win-win. You improve yeah. the yield and you've got less batteries to make to get the higher energy density. Yeah, it, re it remains to be seen, uh, but that's my thoughts, yeah. Yeah, so just to sort of stay on the topic, uh, one of the other Patreon questions um, that we had was, and I'm trying to keep it more on the basics today, mm -hmm. uh, was there were a few questions regarding the Gigafactory. Yeah. So, People were looking at the Gigafactory and they see this massive structure that Tesla was aiming for. And now we sort of see an L shape incomplete structure. So what is the current uh, output of the Gigafactory? I don't know what the current output is. I would say it's between 30 and 35 gigawatts, somewhere around there. But I don't think that uh, the more important question I uh, that comes to my mind when you ask that is, um, why haven't they expanded that that L shape? It looks like, at least from the analysis I've done and the analysis I've seen out there, uh, they have enough battery cells to meet their needs currently. And if they're increasing the energy d density of these cells, if they have been over the you know the past year and it hasn't been reported yet, well, if each cell coming out of the factory has greater en energy density, uh, that's one good reason why you wouldn't need to expand the factory. Uh, because you're getting more energy out from the, the same line. So, and even Elon Musk even said last year that uh, they have enough lines, they just need to get more out of those lines. My view is if Tesla continues ex to expand the rate that they're expanding and Model Y production increases this year, they're probably going to need to start thinking about additional lines soon. Um, maybe at the end of this year or, or into next year. It, it depends on if they're going to do a reshuffle after battery investor day and start moving different cells into different vehicles. And then you get into an infinite number of possibilities of, yeah. of what they could do and how they could fill their need. So, so building on that, do you think the DBE method could be used by Panasonic? Do you think Tesla could have a agreement saying, hey, we've got this new technology would like you guys to use it that way you mm -hmm. can start to free up more of more space within the gigafactory 
Um, I would think not because uh, Panasonic's process is highly proprietary and they have those lines running to shut those downs lines down even for a day or two would be kind of insane. It's like shutting down, shutting down a money printer. It's better just to create new lines. All right, Jordan. Mm. Well, look, thanks heaps for answering those sort of questions. I was really hoping to maybe start off with some of the basics, help get everyone's knowledge up to speed as quick as possible. That way, when all of our viewers are watching Battery Investor Day, they'll be able to understand a lot more of that. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for, for another chat, Jordan. And look, keep up the good work. You're absolutely killing it. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me on.